verticals of the knowledge cluster. Uh, capacity building is one of the vertical and we have uh, environment, water, health. These are the other verticals where the knowledge cluster works. So under the capacity building vertical of the knowledge cluster, we are organizing this series of uh, lectures on the eve of 75 years of uh, independence. And uh, this is in collaboration with the Indian Academy of Sciences. So uh, today is the second uh, talk of this lecture series. And we are very happy to have here uh, with us Professor Sunil Mukhi. I may now request Professor Bhaskar B, who is the senior advisor at the Pune Knowledge Cluster to kindly advise uh, to, uh, sorry, to, uh, to introduce sir. Over to you Bhaskar B, sir. Thank you, Prachi. Good morning to all. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mukhi. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk, uh, which is the second in the series. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Mukhi briefly. Uh, Professor Sunil Mukhi obtained a PhD in theoretical physics from Stony Brook University in 1981, so 40 years back. Uh, his field of specialization is theoretical particle physics. His research has explored mathematical aspects of supersymmetry, supersymmetry, conformational field theory, superstring and M theory, non-commutative uh, field theory, and quantum gravity. After one, working at TIFR Bombay for 27 years, he moved to ISAR Pune, Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research, in 2012 to engage in pedagogy at a larger scale. He was already teaching in TIFR, but here he is now teaching to a uh, you know, undergraduates, postgraduates, and so on. He has taken year-long sabbaticals at C CERN Geneva and the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton and has been a visiting fellow commoner at Trinity College in Cambridge. He is a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Science Academy, and the World Academy of Sciences and has received the Swantishwaru Bhatnagar Prize in Physical Sciences in 1999. He has been an editor of the Journal of High Energy Physics, the leading journal in the field since its inception in 1997. He has a keen interest in academic ethics and chairs the panel, of, panel on scientific values of the Indian Academy of Sciences. With this brief introduction, I now request Sunil to please start his talk. Over to you, Sunil. Thank you so much, Suren, and thank you all for joining. Uh, so this is a kind of a historical survey uh, with a little bit of maybe bias or my own uh, perspective on it. And uh, as uh, the title indicates, it's called Remarkable Outcomes of Mathematical Physics. I should say that for the physicists present, I probably won't have any insights that are not already widely known and widely talked about. But I thought to collect collect some of them uh, and some, some of the issues I'll be discussing are uh, relatively recent um, and some are uh, very old and very well known. And I'll try to spin a certain kind of picture uh, as I go along. Uh, okay, so I'd like to start with this quote. I'm not sure all of you would recognize this person. Uh, this is a very eminent mathematician called Maria Mirza Khani, but she tragically passed away at the age of 40 after receiving the Fields Medal. Um, she wrote uh, or said, I like crossing the imaginary boundaries people set up between different fields. It's very refreshing. And in this context, uh, as a mathematician, uh, the crossing that she did would have been between concepts from what we think of as pure mathematics and concepts that are associated uh, primarily with physics. And uh, one you know, little kind of uh, comment I'll make right at the outset is uh, you know, all of us in India, all of us in PKC, for example, uh, may want to marvel at the fact that uh, there is no joint collaborative activity between any mathematics department and physics any pure mathematics department and theoretical physics in India that I know of. I spent 28 years in TIFR on the same floor as the mathematics department, but the activities were more or less hermetically insulated from each other. So there's something interesting to think about and I, I hope people will actually think. Okay, so let me continue or let me actually start. So the last 120 years have been an era of sensational experimental discoveries in physics. 
So soon after atomic structure was understood, two new fields of physics were created out of nowhere, subatomic physics and then subnuclear or what is called now particle physics. Uh, on, a, on another side, uh, at a, on, on different scale completely, astronomers learned that black holes were the most common objects or are the most common objects in the universe. The physics of materials changed More recently, there are exciting developments in this field uh, in the area of novel topological materials. As the name suggests, these have something to do with mathematics, or at least uh, their understanding does. And I'll touch upon uh, all of these. Now, during the same period, uh, several theoretical revolutions took place. Of course, these are all well, well known and well recorded in history quantum mechanics, special relativity, general relativity, many body uh, of quantum field theory, which started with quantum electrodynamics. Now, not all, but most of these theories originated to explain very specific experimental facts, but they turned out not just to be exp uh, explanations of facts, they turned out to do something a little more than that. Their underlying mathematical structure uh, is something so powerful, so strong, that it gives constraints on what is possible in nature. And this talk is sort of to uh, explore this puzzling reality that using mathematics, you can sort of tell nature what it's allowed and not allowed to do. Um, I'll just pause for a second. Can you hear a banging noise from my end? I think I better close the window. Yes, I'll just try to improve that. may not improve too much but uh, anyway all windows and doors are now closed so one has to hope for the best i suppose people know that icer is constructing some new floors on top of the existing building anyway yeah. okay good fine so let's move on now, uh, the kind of thing I'm going to discuss was first, as far as I know, clearly highlighted by Wigner in 1959. And he wrote this very uh, influential article called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. And, you know, 1959 is a long time ago. And since then, physics has moved far beyond what he could have imagined when he wrote that article. And it has proved his... His, his point to be true in ways that one might not have even uh, imagined. So in this talk, I'll describe how mathematical considerations have led to actual predictions of real phenomena over a wide range of sub areas. And the particular class of sub areas I'll talk about are in particle physics, the discovery of antiparticles. Um, in uh, condensed matter physics, the uh, understanding of topological materials, back to particle physics, the discovery of quarks and hadrons, and in the in in on the large scale uh, in gravity and astron and astrophysics, the concept uh, and detection of black holes. Now, I'm a mathematical physicist myself, so I'll focus on the mathematical inputs. That is not to undermine the other side of the story, about which I'm sure you have heard and will hear many many interesting talks. Also, there are many other examples. I mean, if this talk was two hours long, there could be four more examples as interesting as these four. After I go through the examples, I'll share some concerns about the way people think about this issue of mathematical physics today. Okay, let's start. So a well-known story, but some of you who are students might be hearing it maybe for the first time. Uh, of course, in quantum mechanics, we describe the wave function of particles by this equation. This is a screenshot of the equation from Schrodinger's paper. And um, the problem is that this equation is correct in the domain where it is tested, but it's not compatible with the special theory of relativity. And this kind of problem, theoretical problem, um, can be highlighted best by making a precise statement that the equation you see is not invariant under a certain group, which is the Lorentz group, the symmetry group of special relativity. That group is called SO3, 1. 
Now in 1928, Dirac proposed a new wave equation, which is compatible with SO3, comma one, and which should replace Schrodinger's equation in the relativistic domain. And this is the, uh, a, a, again, a screenshot of the top of his uh, header of his paper uh, in 1928. This is a picture of Dirac in India. I believe the person with him is Purnima Sinha, who was one of the uh, one of the first women, Indian women, to be uh, to work in, uh, in in physics, in modern physics. Um, now here is Dirac's uh, equation in his own notation, and you can see right away it doesn't look much like the Schrodinger equation. Um, but okay, both both equations have something like p a momentum in them and a wave function which solves the equation. But this involves certain matrices. Uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, uh, sigma 3 are the uh, so-called Pauli matrices. So he wrote this equation. Now, uh, the construction of the equation is a very, very logical mathematical process, uh, which asks how you can find a wave equation for a particle uh, consistent with uh, uh, relativity, consistent with SO3, comma 1, but also having certain, uh, also admitting for the fact that the electron for which it was intended uh, should have uh, or does have uh, a spin, an internal angular momentum. And so that's that was enough to, so these very broad facts were enough to uniquely settle the equation. But the equation predicted two types of quantum states. One set were positive energy states, which were immediately thought to be the ones that actually describe the electron, uh, much like those in the Schrodinger equation, but technically somewhat different because of relativity. But then there was another class of states called negative energy states. And the question was, what is this described? So here in a picture, you'll see um, a set of states. These are quantum states. And the X means that they are in principle empty. Uh, and then you're allowed to fill each of these Xs by putting an electron or you don't have to put an electron. If you don't, then it just remains empty. So here's the vacuum, if you like, of this Dirac equation with no electrons in it, just empty. Now, Dirac proposed, so the problem was, what are these negative energy states? But Dirac had a nice idea to account for them. He said, maybe uh, they're already secretly occupied. They're already filled with electrons. And the picture that he uh, provided uh, looks something like this, where you have the positive energy states unoccupied, negative energy states all occupied all the way down to minus infinity. Uh, so that means in some sense that the em that empty space, according to this, is filled with infinitely many electrons, two occupying each of these negative energy states. Why two? Because one has spin up, the other has spin down. And by Pauli's exclusion principle, nothing more is allowed. So once they are filled, they're filled. And this infinite set of negative energy states filled with electrons is one of the most bizarre constructions in uh, physics. Ultimately, I, I don't think that it's actually very fundamental in the modern understanding, but it was very important at that time. And it was also very crazy and confusing and lots of people just didn't believe it. But Dirac went on, of course, he didn't just propose that the negative energy states go away, uh, he realized that there's a way in which we can observe them, which is if an electron that's filling the negative energy state makes a transition out of the sea onto the land as, you, as it were, then it will leave behind an empty space. And this is the picture uh, and here's the transition. So this arrow shows that what was a filled state below uh, with E less than zero has jumped. So the electron has jumped up and uh, acquired a positive energy and it leaves behind a vacancy or a hole. But now, uh, uh, kind of double negative, the hole has negative energy. That means, I mean, so that the place where the hole is has negative energy, but the hole is the absence of an electron. So it's the negative of that. So that thing which remains behind behaves like a positive energy particle. So in other words, uh, this process, which occurs when we give energy to the system, uh, creates a positive energy electron and it also creates a positive energy hole, both of them. So it creates two particles. So of course, energy is not, conservation is not violated. We have, we have to give energy to the system to make this happen. But when we do that, two particles are created. One is a familiar electron and the other has all the properties 
that are ab, uh, opposite to those of the electron. Namely, it has the opposite electric charge and it's called a positron. But it was a particle that was never seen in 1928 when he wrote this paper. He also struggled uh, thinking that maybe this thing is not a positron, but a, a new particle, maybe it's just a proton and so on. But turns out that it has to have the same mass as the electron. And so you have to postulate a new particle. And then you have to postulate that electrons and positrons have to be created in pairs. Now, physics at that time uh, was very, uh, physicists were very negative about proposing things which have not been seen and then making up rules which also have not been seen, just making a whole system like a logical system, uh, none of which has been seen. Uh, and it sounded like a mathematical fantasy, but turns out that it's pretty real. Uh, a few years later, Carl Anderson detected positrons in cosmic rays. Uh, and basically what you see is the red track in this Wilson cloud chamber. Uh, the, uh, one, the one on the left, which is black, uh, is that of an electron which bends in a magnetic field, but because the positron has the opposite charge, it bends the opposite way. So there was a very simple signature for positrons, uh, a track which looks like an electron track, but is bending the opposite way from the way an electron should be bending. Okay. Now, there's a nice and interesting story about this, this the detail about this history, which is that probably if Dirac had never written his equation, Anderson would still have found uh, positrons uh, by this experiment. Um, and in fact, after Anderson found positrons, people were still reluctant to associate them to Dirac's uh, paper and Dirac's equation. It was as if he was proposing something, but people found that thing so bizarre. But when that thing was found, exactly that thing, the thing which he proposed, as we know now today, people were like, okay, what is found is found. But surely it has nothing to do with his absurd ideas about, uh, about negative energy states. Well, it turns out everything about these positrons follows from what Dirac predicted. And in fact, uh, there are many other forms of antimatter, such as antimuons, antiquarks, antineutrinos. Turns out that the whole um, set of particles had to be doubled, literally doubled, because of Dirac's uh, mathematical pro uh, proposal uh, based on. Uh, special relativity. So that's one history. Now from uh, 1920s and 30s, let's jump uh, to the 21st century essentially, although some of this started in the 20th century. Um, and some of, yeah, some of it started around the time of Dirac. Uh, so it, it's a very curious and checkered history. So after, and so you could ask the question, well, I listed antiquarks, antineutrinos and so on. Does every fermion have to have, or does every particle have an antiparticle? And the answer is no. Photons do not have antiparticles, or they are their own antiparticles. Likewise, the Z boson is an example of a particle, which is its own antiparticle. So what if there was a fermion, uh, which was also its own antiparticle? Uh, such a thing was not kind of accounted for by Dirac's equation, at least in its form. But uh, an Italian physicist who led a very mysterious life called Ettore Majorana proposed that some fermions, which are not electrically charged, might be their own antiparticles. Why do they have to be not charged? It's because if they have a charge, then the antiparticle must have the opposite charge. That's part of Dirac's prediction. And if that is so, obviously, then the particle and antiparticle cannot be the same. But if it's neutral, it has a better chance to be the same as its antiparticle. And he wrote down a formula which basically modified Dirac's equation in a certain way, which made it clear that one can have such particles and they got named Majorana fermions. So Majorana fermion is just a hypothetical type of fermionic particle, which is its own antiparticle. Uh, unfortunately, to date, no such elementary particle has ever been seen. Uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, after, at a certain point, Ettore Majorana himself was never seen again. He, he mysteriously vanished uh, in, at a young age. And uh, so his life story is incomplete because nobody actually knows what happened to him. So neither his particle nor he himself were seen after this very promising start to his career. 
Now let me jump to 1978 from the 1940 years after that. Edward Witten, a leading mathematical physicist who has in fact uh, got the Fields Medal, which is the highest uh, award uh, for for uh, for you know for for mathematical uh, for for mathematics in pure mathematics. Uh, he, in 1978, studied hypothetical particles called magnetic monopoles. And, and uh, he pointed out some nice properties about them, but he was not the first to study monopoles. Actually, Dirac was among the first to study magnetic monopoles, and even the story of his equation is in some way tied up with monopoles. But uh, Witten studied them afresh. This is not a totally fashionable subject because uh, all the evidence is that such objects don't exist. Uh, magnetic monopoles, just to remind you, are hypothetical particles that have only a north pole or only a south pole of magnetic charge and not the other pole, and such a thing is not seen in nature. Now, Witten pointed out that if a certain symmetry, which is called CP, standing for charge conjugation and parity, if this combination of charge conjugation and parity symmetry is violated in nature, then magnetic monopole in a certain way, uh, then magnetic monopoles acquire electric charges and become dions. Dions have both electric and magnetic charge. So basically what he was saying is take a magnetic monopole, but embed it in a theory which violates CP symmetry, then automatically uh, that particle also has a fractional electric charge whose amount is proportional to the amount of CP symmetry violation. Now, again, to date, no monopoles have ever been seen in nature, nor have any dions been seen in nature, nor have any particles with fractional electric charge been seen in nature. Okay, At least not the kind of fractions that he was proposing, which are proportional to some continuous CP violation parameter. Okay. But some years after Witten's work, Frank Wilczek, another distinguished physicist uh, who actually has a Nobel Prize for a completely different piece of work, which I might discuss later, he noticed that if certain hypothetical particles called axions exist, now these are particles that are proposed in the context of, uh, of, of I mean, that are, that are possibly observable astrophysically, uh, and they are proposed uh, in connection with CP symmetry. So they, 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 are, they arise naturally in theories where CP symmetry is violated. Okay, So he proposed that if these particles exist, then the laws of electromagnetism are modified with interesting consequences. And he wrote down some kind of theory called axion electrodynamics. But of course, it was a theory about particles which are hypothetical. And to date, axions, despite a lot of searching, have never been seen. So I've put together for you three points from history where particles were proposed that were not seen. One was Majorana's um, part fermions that are their own antiparticles. One was Witten's fractionally charged, uh, electrically charged dions. And one was uh, Wilczek's axions. Okay. I mean, these have been discussed by other people. I've just highlighted three proposals about them which seem in somewhat independent and which also seem uh, to be about nothing in particular because these particles don't exist and often thought of as theoretical ideas, which were just that. However, recently, all three concepts have been realized in the last couple of decades in materials, not in uh, vacuum, not in the nature of elementary particles, but in topological materials. And these materials, as you must have heard, surely, because they uh, crop up in, uh, in newspaper reports a lot, uh, their key property is that the way the bulk of the material behaves with respect to conductivity and other things is not the way the boundary behaves. So, for example, this golden uh, cube has the property that it may be an ins that it would be an insulator in the bulk, so the bulk cannot pass current, but the boundary can pass current. So it's, uh, it's, it, it, it conducts in a very strange way only on its boundary. Now, you may ask what's so great about this. I can take a block of wood and paste some aluminum foil on all sides and I'll get what looks like this. That's not the point because I don't paste anything. It's a material which has this property. So if I actually take a knife and slice this cube into two half cubes, 
again it will conduct on its boundary and not in the bulk it's a property of the material now this is really shocking it's not something we manufacture it's intrinsic to the material and so uh, we call it surface states it means that the material has one way of conducting electricity in its bulk and another way on the boundary and there are many fascinating features but the one of interest to us is that uh, uh, tells uh, you know has this property that certain certain kinds of insulators called time reversal in, invariant insulators uh, the analogs of ions that witten discussed and axions that will will check discussed are seen in these materials in fact in this important paper in 2008 the authors showed that a certain observable in these materials called magnetoelectric polarization uh, that observable plays the role of an axion and it actually satisfies the same equations uh, as uh, those of wilczek's axion electrodynamics they also uh, found that if there's a temporal gradient that means this quantity is varying in time steadily increasing in time say then it induces what you could call the temporal magnetoelectric effect and when that effect is taking place in the material then magnetic excitation satisfy witten's formula for ions so ions and axions though they look very exotic in particle physics are less than exotic in materials in fact they look uh at least theoretically they are predicted uh to to occur in topological materials now uh some of these predictions i should emphasize are theoretical as yet and their verification is still a little controversial uh so you know it may be uh that these are false alarms but it could also be that these predictions are completely verified to everyone's uh to everyone's satisfaction in the next few years my purpose in highlighting this field here is because it's unlike that of uh, of of positrons this is a live field of research at the time of i'm giving this talk so here is a kind of uh, you know popular review that came as an article in one of the science journals physics and uh, basically says that this exotic concept of axions was born long ago to resolve a puzzle Uh, related to strong interactions but the same physics though in a much different context applies to an unusual class of insulators and the author has this very provocative sentence these developments have propelled axion electrodynamics from an ideal curiosity to an experimentally observable reality i would personally take issue with the use of the word ideal which i put in in red for this reason uh, in my view it was never an ideal curiosity uh, it was an investigation into the mathematical framework of quantum field theory which we know is broadly a correct framework and certain uh, properties uh, effects uh, novel effects and novel kinds of particles uh, naturally arise in that framework and it should not be a surprise that they are also connected to experimentally observable reality now i talked about axions and ions what about uh, majorana's original proposal well his fermions have been detected or it's claimed to have been detected as surface states in a topological superconductor and so there's this paper from two or three years ago and i think this is still somewhat controversial but uh, it's hotly discussed and i think it's an important paper which provides evidence for these so called majorana particles and the evidence uh, is encoded in the behavior of some of these plots uh but again i'm not an expert in this field and probably won't even be able to describe the evidence in any detail and as as i as i said it's still under discussion the important thing though is that majorana who had this wonderful idea in the 1930s purely based on the mathematics of dirac's equation and a simple concept of a physical concept of antiparticle uh seems to be alive and well but in a totally different area of physics with that let me turn to my third topic but let me also pause for questions i'd be very happy to take questions i'm about halfway through the talk right now uh, is it okay to have questions or maybe there are no questions um so participants if you have any questions you can type it in the chat box yeah 
so we can either have it now or at the end of the talk okay so i suggest people type in the chat box and uh, something has dropped up in the chat box helpful so far thank you dr sundaram um okay let me continue but you may keep typing in the chat box i'll consult it little later okay so here's uh, a discussion of hadrons and quarks so uh, now back from from the present time back to the 1950s during this time uh people understood that there's a type of interaction called the strong interaction in nuclear matter uh, the nucleus had just been uncovered just before this and many new and, and among strongly interacting particles are the well known protons and neutrons which make up the nucleus of every atom now it seemed that protons and neutrons are quite enough we don't need any other particle to describe the nucleus of atoms it's just a bound state of protons and neutrons but turned out many other particles whose interactions are similar to those of protons and neutrons at short distance uh, and which are therefore strongly interacting which experience this nuclear force uh, and which got the name hadrons uh, were being discovered now the 50s and 60s was a strange period uh, quite unlike the present day you must be you must be aware that this large hadron collider runs for years and years and people keep saying well it found this higgs particle but nothing else is coming out of it at that time if you ran an experiment for a year you found new particles guaranteed and these were not very high energy experiments even so particles kept kept being discovered and there were just too many and the whole simplicity of particle physics based on protons electrons and uh, and and particles of light photons was being uh, destroyed by all these new particles showing up it was not clear why nature provided them in 1961 uh, murray gelman and independently yuval neyman provided proposed a scheme to classify these new particles in a sense uh, it's like you know uh, in 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 studying species in biology obviously Uh, one of the important thing is to classify them and then classify sub classify sub classify so that then you get groups of objects that you can study uh, more effectively but gelman and neyman both knew uh, something uh, about mathematics called the su which was very exotic to physicists at the time it's a group of certain types of 3 by 3 matrices unitary matrices and they noted uh, here is gelman's uh, kind of uh, note it was like an internal note not a real paper uh, and noted that these baryons that the hadrons which was further subclassified into baryons and mesons depending whether they had half integer or integer spin uh, seemed to follow some rules associated to the mathematics of su3 it was a bit like reading a mathematics book or with one hand and looking at particle data with the other and finding that things match that's a favorite activity of crackpot scientists by the way but turns out uh, in this case it was anything but crackpot okay so representations of lie algebras are certain vector spaces on which the symmetries act and they found that the uh, structure of these particles uh, had some resemblance to the rules of su3 representations So here is a, for, a picture that is quite commonly shown. Uh, it shows a hexagon with two dots at the center, and what they noted is that uh, first of all, that this diagram, hexagon with two dots at, in the center, is known in mathematics as the adjoint representation of SU three. Okay, and uh, it has certain axes along which certain quantities, mathematical quantities, vary. But they also noticed that the physical particles, the neutron, proton. sigma minus sigma 0 sigma plus psi minus and psi 0 and uh, lambda all of these eight particles perfectly fitted this uh, hexagon with two dot kind of structure and moreover uh, they had something called a strangeness quantum number as well as the familiar electric charge quantum number and these varied as you went along the vertical axis or the diagonal axis so you can see that as i go along this direction the electric charge goes from minus to 1 to 0 to plus 1 minus 1 to 0 to plus 1 so uh, and strangeness which i don't have time to explain uh, is along the vertical axis the neutron and proton being very well known particles were not strange these other ones had certain property called strangeness which was given to it by particle physicists doing experiments so they were like why 
does strangeness and charge match with some mathematical axes? And why do the particles sit in this hexagon? And why do they all have their masses in a somewhat similar range of 940 to about 1400 mega electron volts? So they went on looking and they realized that SU3 has many representations, but the simplest ones have dimension 3, 8, and 10. So if you had seven particles or four particles that had similar properties, you could not use SU3 to classify them. They had to fit in with exactly these numbers. Okay, The simplest ones have these numbers 3, 8, and 10, then they are more complicated with larger numbers. Now, Gelman noticed in particular that the new mesons and baryons, which were coming out in the year that he was working, uh, fitted nicely into the 8 and 10 representations, but with some gaps. In particular, one of the sets of mesons had seven particles accounted for, but we need to fit into this hexagon figure, we need eight particles, six for the vertices and two dots at the center. And one of the dots didn't exist. So he said, well, it means one more particle is needed to fill this octet, and he predicted it with its decay modes. And here is a screen grab from his actual uh, internal note. It said the most clear-cut new prediction for pseudoscalar mesons is the existence of a new one, he called it chi zero, which should decay into two photons like the pion, unless it is heavy enough, blah, blah, blah. In latter case, we must. So you see, it could do quite a lot of detailed thinking about what it should do, but it wasn't, it didn't even exist. Well, this particle today known as the eta had exactly the properties that Gelman had predicted. Now, his work was not yet published. This thing I've shown you is an internal preprint. So the prediction was not properly acknowledged. And um, which I just came across recently, pointing out that, you know, in the mind of a physicist or, 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 well, in the mind of, I don't know, in the mind of maybe most people, in order to, um, to make a prediction, it really needs to be a prediction in time, in the sense you need to predict something before that thing has been seen. Now, modern day physicists will often call it a prediction, even if you predict something that was seen 20 years ago. Uh, that's not predict, of course, it's post dict. But uh, the point is finding an explanation from equations is an achievement, even if the thing was known. In this case, the order of prediction and discovery was a bit murky to people because they had not seen Gelman's paper. But in retrospect, it was a prediction and it would be a prediction even if he wrote his paper 10 years later. Anyway, he didn't get discouraged. He repeated the miracle in 1962. There were lots of particles, so you could work with other ones now. And he grouped a set of known baryons into the 10-dimensional representation called the decuplet, decu for 10. And he found one missing. Again, it was completely unknown. The omega baryon. And he said it should have strangeness minus 3, electric charge minus 1, same as the electron, mass around 1680 mega electron volts. And sure enough, a particle with exactly these properties was found in 1964. This time he had a two-year head start over the discovery. And he was getting well known by now. Uh, and uh, you know he was he was writing things and, and and talking about them to people, so people knew that it's Gelman's confirmed. And so here is the picture of what was not known before the prediction, and what was then discovered to fill in these diagrams beautifully. So this again is a diagram from the mathematics of the Lie algebra or Lie group SU three, and it has this nice triangular structure with four, three, two, one particles and all of these fitted beautifully only this last one wasn't known till it was predicted by him. good now gelman works but maybe the 